right, so here we are with another topic. So this topic, I guess, just briefly, you could call it partial fractions. So if you were looking in a book or trying to find information about this elsewhere, it would probably just be called partial fractions or partial fraction decomposition, something like that. Um, and so my first problem is, a, as far as this goes, it's a pretty basic example. And before I show you how this is done, try to think about, uh, does this problem look vastly different than other problems that you already know how to do? Like just, does it look like it could be U substitution? Or does it look like it could be trig substitution? Or integration by parts or, or whatever? You get the idea, right? Uh, so, well, we might think about it like this. Uh, maybe u substitution, but if you were going to let u be x squared minus 81, the du would be 2x dx, and you're not going to get that x dx you need up there for u substitution. So, it's not u substitution. Here's a slide from a video I made before on trig substitution. And I said, that's for sums and differences of squares. And I, in the videos, I gave you some guidelines, and we did problems and so on. It kind of looks like it could be this kind of problem. Uh, like if the integral contains 9 minus x squared, that's a sine substitution. So that's the kind of problem that can be done by trig substitution. But that contains a difference of squares where it's a constant squared minus x squared. This is not like that. This is x squared minus 9 squared. So it's, although it is a difference of squares, it's not, it's not the right kind to be trig substitution. All right? So yes, this is, as you would guess, this is a new type of problem. We'll do it by this method called partial fractions. Okay? All right. So how about this? Before we do this one, hopefully since I established that it's a, a new type of problem, Let's look at it like this, okay? What you're looking at right now is basically what partial fractions are, okay? It's where we take a fraction, you know, like, like this, that's factorable down there, and we see this as a common denominator of other fractions that were added together, right? So is that conceivable to you? Do you think that to get this, if I've got x squared minus 81 and I see that that does factor as x plus 9 times x minus 9, is it conceivable to you that this could be the result of a fraction over x plus 9 plus another fraction over x minus 9? Because those two fractions would have this common denominator. So I'm just trying to get you to believe it's conceivable that you could add them together and get that. And if we can break this down into this, these are simpler and easier to work with than that is, okay? So when this is sometimes called partial fraction decomposition, going this direction is the decomposition, taking something and breaking it into smaller and simpler parts. Okay, so hopefully that you, you're, we, even though we haven't done anything yet with it, that's at least conceivable to you that it can be done. So the big question at this point is then what's A and B? What should those numbers be for this to work out? Okay, there's some fine tuning here that that and that number have to be just right. Okay, so here's what we'll do. Let's go ahead and let's just work with this part of it. All right, so I've got one over, and this original thing right here, x plus nine, x minus 9. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add these together and force my result to be equal to this. Okay? And here's what I mean by that. For these, they have, as I was trying to tell you in the beginning, they have a lowest common denominator of x plus 9 times x minus 9. So I will get that common denominator. I will add them together as you add fractions, and I will force it to be equal to that. That's how I'll solve for A and B. So this first fraction right here, you know, as it is, it stands at A times X plus 9. And I'll multiply that by X minus 9 on the top, X minus 9 on the bottom. That'll give me that common denominator. 
that's how I'll modify that first one. And then the second one over here, so I've got B on top, and then I've got X minus nine as it stands. But I would need to multiply that one by X plus nine on the top and X plus nine on the bottom. Now, I've got the order different on these, but it's the same number, right? You, doesn't, the order you multiply numbers doesn't matter. So that is a common denominator, all right? So we'll go on to the next step then. So here, I know that these two things are adding together to get that. So I'm gonna preserve this thing on the left-hand side of the equation, okay? And if I were to add these together, now that they have a common denominator, what I would get is a times x minus nine plus b times x plus nine over that common denominator, which I'll just write as x plus nine times x minus nine. It's backwards over there, but it's the same number. All right, now I can equate the left and the right hand sides of this equation by, I guess I call it symmetry. You know, is the denominator on each part the same? It's the same. So doesn't that mean if these two things are equal, the numerators have to be the same, okay? Uh, if you, if you want a, an analogy that's a little bit simpler, it's kind of like if I said uh, two-fifths is equal to what over five? Well, the, the fives are equal, I mean, so, so this number's gotta be two, right? I mean, if that's not a two, how is this going to be equal to that over there? I'm thinking about it that way, all right? So I'll just say this. I'll say this here needs to be 1, all right? And then I can do like this. And then I'm getting a little bit closer to my answer. Now, at this point, there are different ways that I could show you how this is done, all right? Um, I'm going to show you a way that I think is all purpose. Uh, even though there's a little bit simpler way that I can show you how to do this problem, I'd rather show you a, something here that's going to work for other problems that you'll see. So keep in mind, if you ask somebody else um, or you look somewhere else, you might see something a little bit different than I'm about to show you. But what I'm showing you will work for all the other problems that you see. Okay, so say I multiply through here, and say I collect like terms together, and by like terms I mean some of the terms have an x and some of them don't, okay? Uh, the terms that don't have an x will be constants. I mean, at the end of the day, a and b will be constant. So let's see, I'll have ax plus bx, okay, so those are like terms, minus 9a plus 9b. So those would be like terms. I'll do one more thing. I will factor out the a or the x from the a and the b. So I'll get a coefficient of a plus b x minus a constant of 9a plus 9b. So x is the variable. a and b and 9, those are all constants. All right. Okay. Now, this has got to be 1, right? How are we going to make that, be, or how are we even going to think about that being one? How about this? Let's say, let's call it zero x plus one. Isn't that the same as there just being a one? Why would I write zero x? Well, because over here I'm looking at it like it's, there's a something times x minus a constant, okay? And if this is going to be equal to one, if this is going to be equal to that, then the coefficient of the x needs to be zero. And then this constant term over here needs to be one, all right? This has got to be zero x plus one. That's the way it's gonna work out, all right. So again, by symmetry, I need the, the right-hand side to look like the left-hand side, even if I intentionally write that there's a zero coefficient for the x. So here's where my red lines uh, become relevant. I'll say a plus b, that needs to be zero, okay? And then 
negative 9a plus 9b, that needs to be 1. And what we have at this point is a system of linear equations, which they can be solved by the addition method or the substitution method. Okay, now that's something you've probably seen before. If you need to review it, that's okay. You can let me know. Uh, I'll do substitution. Like, So I'll say, well, look, I could solve this for A, and it says A is negative B. And then I can put that substitution in here. Okay? So we'll look at it like this. Equation 1 says A is negative B. And then I'm going to sub that into the second one. And it's going to say negative 9 times a, but that's negative b, plus 9 times b equals 1. And then that gives me something I can solve for b, okay? All right, so I get 9b plus 9b is 1, 18b is 1, or b is 1 over 18, okay? So I found like that first number then, all right? So what about the other one? There was B and there was A. Okay, so it, A plus B is zero. If A is the negative of B, then that means that A is negative one over 18. All right, and I've got it. That's the breakdown. That's the decomposition of this thing that I started with, okay, up there. I found the A and the B. All right, so it, like we could do this now if you wanted to. It's a raise. Okay, so I found A to be negative one over 18. So it's like, I've got this number up here, negative one over 18. And then I found B to be one over 18. So that's what that number is. So there's the breakdown for this. And, you know, 1 over 18 might not be your favorite number, but it's just a constant, and it won't be that hard to deal with when we go to the next step, okay? All right, now, so before I show you this original problem, see this one right here, let's keep in mind, we now know that this breaks down into this, okay? So that's what we're prepared to use. All right, now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this piece of paper handy, and I'm going to update over here, okay? So here's my problem. It was this, but I realized that I had no method to handle that 1 over x squared minus 81. Through partial fraction decomposition, I was able to break it down like this. Negative 1 over 18, and it was x plus 9, plus 1 over 18, x minus 9. And realize it or not, these are much easier to deal with. Okay? Uh, here's what I mean. So I can break this integral apart across the plus, and I can factor out the constants. So here's what it becomes. Negative 1 over 18 times the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 9 dx. Okay, plus, see that plus right there, okay. And then I'll take this constant out, 1 over 18 times the antiderivative of 1 over x minus 9 dx. Okay, so are these easier to deal with? Are these easier to deal with than that was? Well, both of these, okay, everything that you see now, in this integral right here is a very simple u substitution okay both of these are of the form 1 over u du which has antiderivative natural log absolute value of u plus c they're both like that because if you're going to say well i'll let you be x plus 9 du would be dx and if you're going to say I was going to let u be x minus 9, the u would still be dx. So they're both just u substitution. So that's what this breakdown does. You know, I have really no options for this, but if this is the same thing in the sense that 
If you added these two fractions together and you get that, they're the same. These are easier to work with, so I work with these. Okay, so here's what we get. Negative 1 over 18, natural log absolute value x plus 9. Okay, and then for this one, 1 over 18, natural log absolute value x minus 9. And then we're all done plus c. All right, there it is. That is how partial fractions work. You get lots of this form once the partial fraction is done. Not every problem will be like this, 1 over u du, but just by nature of it, many of them are. Okay? All right. Now, really, I think that if I got you to this point, you could probably work it the rest of the way. That's not my big concern right now. My big concern, uh, being that this is our first lesson on this topic, is that you understood my train of thought here. The conception of how you could break this down. The solving for the unknown numbers. You got to know how to get a common denominator between fractions and add them together. And maybe the strangest part, how to equate the left and right hand sides of what I had. Okay. All right, now, but this, we'll do some other examples, so this won't be the last time that you see it. Let's, let's see another one for the sake of comparison. So, how about something like this? Okay. All right, so say we had this problem right here. 7 over 8x plus 1 uh, times x plus 1. Okay. That is kind of like the last one. I factored this already, but you know maybe you see it as 8x squared uh, plus 9x plus 1 or something like that. So say you get something and it's you don't have a method for it, but you realize that you can factor it. So here I've given you something already factored. Then you think, well, if I could factor it, I could see these factors as the common denominator of fractions like this. So that's like the one I just showed you. It's the same concept, okay? Now it turns out the form this takes influences what this is gonna look like. But uh, here's how the rule works. If these are distinct linear factors, so distinct means that they're different. Linear means that they're all x to the first power, so no x squares or anything like that. If what you're dealing with up there has distinct linear factors, then we say a over the first factor plus b over the second, okay? That's the decomposition if you have distinct linear factors. All right, so, but that's like the first one. That, that's how we did the first one. In a minute, we'll see one that is not distinct linear factors, and this part becomes a little bit different in that case, all right? Okay, now, so what we do to solve for a and b, remember, is we add these together and we force to be equal to that. All right. So here it goes. I'm gonna I'll copy down the left hand side. I had a seven, and then that was over eight x plus one times x plus one, and I'm going to add these together. And of course, they have that common denominator. So I'm going to get for them a eight x plus one. And I'm going to need to multiply this by x plus 1 on the top, x plus 1 on the bottom. Okay? And this other one, b. In order to get my common denominator, I will multiply it by 8x plus 1. Let's do like this. Like that. Like this. Okay, and then that's how we get a common denominator. Now, can you do this part in your head? Yes, I mean, do you even have to write the bottom part? No, I mean, I'm just writing it because uh, sometimes people don't like it when I skip too many steps. But, you know, if you're aware of how this plays out when you get a common denominator, that's all you need to look at up there, okay? Why is that? Well, because when I add these together, now that I have a common denominator then of course this part is going to be equal to that part. The denominators will be the same. They're common. It doesn't add any information to the problem. 
It's just that this top part is going to have to turn out to be 7, right? So, okay, we'll get like this, and we'll get like this. Okay, and is this over the common denominator? Yes. Is the 7 over the common denominator? Yes. Well, but, okay, they match already. So it's just this I need to worry about, all right? Okay, so what did we do before? Let's see, we multiplied through. So that will be a times x plus a, and this will be 8 times bx if we multiply like that, and plus b. And then I combine my like terms. Some of my terms have x and some of them don't. So let's do the a x and we'll add the 8 b x and I'll get the a and the b over here so those terms have an x and these are constant what else I'll factor the x out so I can see what the coefficient is so this would be a plus 8 b x right and this would just be a plus b. All right, so this will have to be seven. This has a term with an x in it and a term that's constant. The a plus b is gonna have to be seven. That's the element of this that's constant. What about the a plus eight b? The coefficient of the x, what's that gonna need to be? Well, in that other problem I said, I'll like intentionally write that seven is zero x plus seven. Uh, if, so if you want to do that, if it helps you think about it, then you can do it that way. So just look at that and look at that. How are they going to be equal? How is this going to be equal to that? Well, this number, the coefficient of that x, is going to have to be 0. And then this number, which is a constant, is going to have to be 7. Okay? That's the only way to get it to all match up. So let's express what these red arrows are saying in terms of linear equations. That'll be a plus 8b is going to need to be 0. And then a plus b is going to need to be 7. That's how it's going to work out. All right. So before, remember uh, with that last one, I happened to solve these by substitution. You can, you can do it that way. Uh, you could use the addition method. I, I wasn't going to take this video to review how you solve a linear system, but let's just do this. Uh, so say I take this and I solve it for a, and I say a is equal to 7 minus b. Okay. And then I sub into that other one. Okay, so a there, right there, that's going to be 7 minus b and then plus 8b is equal to 0. Okay, we're getting a little bit closer. So that says 7 plus, that's going to be 7b is equal to 0. That says 7b is negative 7, so that makes b equal to negative 1. Okay? All right, so that number is a negative 1 in the breakdown. Okay? What about that other number a, like this number right here? What's that? Well, it, I have here that a is 7 take away b. So if I know that b is negative 1, what's 7 take away negative 1? That would be, that'd be 8. Okay, so a is equal to 8. All right, so I've got what I need then. All right, let's take this. So you see those numbers? b is negative 1, a is 8. So that's this part right here. This was my breakdown. I found A and B, okay? So let's continue. And I'm going to use this form of what I started with, given that I know A and B, all right? So A is 8, B is negative 1. So I'll get 8 over 8x plus 1, okay? And I could put negative 1 for B, but I could also do minus 1 over x plus 1. It's all the same thing. All right. So now this is what we're looking at. Okay. 
All right, all right. So let's figure out about this. Uh, like with any problem, we have to figure out um, what kind of substitution is it, or if it's u substitution. These are both u substitution. And if you let this, so let me, again, let me make this, this note here. We've done in calculus two, we do so much u substitution that at a certain point, I, I want to leave that to you unless you need help, you can reach out for help. But these are both, again, u substitution of the form one over u du. Okay, so like the last one. So for example, like if I was gonna work these one at a time, if I was gonna let eight x plus one be u, then eight or du would be eight dx. Well, I got eight dx already. So that's gonna be one over u du the way it is. Here, if uh, u was x plus one, again, du would be dx. All right, so what I'm gonna get with my u substitutions, get natural log, 8x plus 1 minus natural log x plus 1 and then plus c. All right, and then we've got what we need. Um, now, so in this video, I have showed you the case of how you do partial fraction decomposition if you have distinct linear factors linear factors that are different all right see this that's the breakdown in another video we'll talk about if these are something else than distinct linear factors